Who else? Professional activists have also been helping to write IPCC reports. Now, these are people who are taking paychecks from activist organizations. We have Richard Moss, who has been involved with the IPCC for 20 years. During part of that time, he was a vice president of the World Wildlife Fund. Bill Hare is considered a legend in Greenpeace. He has been a spokesperson since the early 1990s for Greenpeace. And when the last report came out in 2007, he was one of only 40 people who helped to write the synthesis report, which is the summary of summaries, because IPCC reports are thousands of pages. You need some executive summaries. He's in the inner circle writing that report. Now, there are more students. There are more activists. But we, we don't have a lot of time today. So I'm, you know, in my book, these are not the only ones by any means. So here's two more, Michael Oppenheimer. He worked for 20 years for the Environmental Defense Fund. It's a very wealthy, very influential activist group in, um, in the US. He is currently leading an IPCC chapter for the upcoming report. And Jennifer Morgan, she looks like a very pleasant person. I'm sure she'd be really fun to have coffee or a drink with. But she is not one of the world's finest scientific minds. If you look at Jennifer's CV, she has spent her entire career working for one activist group after another activist group. And for a while, in fact, she was the World Wildlife Fund's chief spokesperson on climate change. Nevertheless, the IPCC has appointed her to work on its current report. Now, there's another problem with activism and, and the IPCC, and that's that in 2004, something very curious started to happen, and that's that the World Wildlife Fund began very deliberately to recruit IPCC personnel. And by 2008, according to documents available on their website, it had persuaded 130 people that it described as leading climate scientists mostly but not exclusively from the IPCC to join its own panel. So this was work on the last IPCC report, AR4, was just beginning around in 2004. So at the very moment that these scientists, these leading climate scientists, were supposed to be making a very neutral and objective and impartial examination of the evidence around climate change, they decided to get into bed with the WWF. And what effect did that have? Well, in two-thirds of the chapters for the last major IPCC report, there was at least one in as many as nine WWF-affiliated scientists working on that. In one-third of the chapters, one of the leaders was a WWF-affiliated scientist. There was a chapter that concluded that 20 to 30 percent of the world's species are threatened with extinction. Both leaders of that chapter were affiliated with the WWF, plus six other people. So the IPCC stacked the species extinction chapter with eight WWF people. Are we really surprised that they, can, that they then concluded that species extinction is a big concern with respect to climate change? So a few weeks after my book was released, the WWF issued a press release in which they said, oh, no, no, the, the IPCC hasn't been infiltrated by us. There's a little bit of overlap. There's some overlap. Well, in my view, when two-thirds of your chapters are, include WWF people, that's, that's an invasion. That's not a bit of overlap. That's a really big concern. So who really writes IPCC reports? Students, unqualified scientists, professional activists, and scientists who are so unsophisticated and so naive that they don't appreciate that you should not be getting into bed with activist groups at the very moment that you are, have been entrusted by the entire world to take very close and careful um, a look at the evidence around these issues. So what does this mean? It means that a very simple question, who writes IPCC reports, 
what we think the answer is, what everyone thinks the answer is, is actually it's, it's wrong. That it's not, and now I'm, I am told as a journalist that there is a consensus about what the science is around climate change. And I, I'm not in a position to know whether that, that consensus is valid or not. But I do know that the consensus around the very simple question of who writes IPCC reports is, is wrong. Okay, now I'm rushing here because my presentation is a bit longer than the time allotted. Um, there are other claims about the IPCC that turn out not to be true. We're told that it's utterly transparent. No, I'm sorry, it's not. And there are a number of people who've looked at that question independently, and we've all come to the same conclusion. We're told that there are policies and procedures, and that these are followed rigorously. In fact, I'm having a difficult time finding a single rule that the IPCC did follow. Like, really, truly, it's, it's, it's amazing. I've never seen a story like this one. We've been told that the IPCC relies solely on peer-reviewed literature. And um, the chairman of the IPCC likes to go around the world saying, we don't settle for anything less than peer-reviewed literature. If it hasn't appeared in a peer-reviewed journal, you can just throw it into the dustbin. That's what he says. But in fact, when I um, invited some people about a year and a half ago to help me on my blog look at the references cited by the 2007 IPCC report, we found approximately one-third of those references were not to peer-reviewed literature. There's a huge gap between the rhetoric of the IPCC and the reality. So there are wider implications, and, the pro and, and what we have then is we have an organization in which lots and lots of people, hundreds, thousands of people are involved with the IPCC. Many, many people knew that a number of the authors who are involved are not remotely the world's finest scientific minds. Many people knew that it was not based solely on peer-reviewed literature. But there have been no open letters. No one apparently took Chairman Pachori aside and said, sir, you can't go around saying that publicly. It's not true. We have an organization that has been saying very misleading things to the public and to policymakers and to lawmakers for a long time. And it's been this conspiracy of silence. And I think that tells us something about the integrity of this organization, about how trustworthy it is. So my book's conclusion, I've just given you a very quick overview, is that the IPCC is an organization that doesn't describe its own personnel, its own reports, or its own procedures accurately. That's pretty basic stuff. And if it can't do that, why would we imagine that it has understood far more complicated questions and that it has come to the right conclusions? So um, my message as a journalist to lawmakers is be very careful when you hear that the IPCC says that um, it, has, it has reached this conclusion or that we should do, um, proceed down this path because this is not a trustworthy organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, we still have a good role, don't we, for investigative journalists despite all that's going on at the moment. Thank you so much. And I have a personal response, if I may, Donna, because during the 2000s, I was one of the few voices that was saying that the IPCC was politically decision-making. And, of course, I was taken every now and again to complaints, all the rest of it. And, of course, what we've seen unravelling, and through not just your own work, but all has just been a vindication of that position. I said it openly in the great global warming swindle, some of you will remember, and, in fact, it's, it's been criticised since, but, of course, we've learnt a lot more. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I'm sure people will want to read your book. I'm absolutely certain about it.